Hi everyone and welcome to today's Field Fisher Silicon Valley webinar. Um, up front, massive apologies for being a little bit late here. We had some technical issues, um, but hopefully you can all see the slides on the screen. If anyone can't, just let me know in the chat and, and we'll make sure we fix that. Um, but welcome to today's session. I'm Flick, I'm a partner here in the team. Um, we're really excited because today we have a guest speaker, um, Stefan Zimprich, who's a partner in our Hamburg team. Um, and like me, he's a data privacy and consumer law specialist. Um, but he's also a litigator in the space and is visiting us in the Silicon Valley here this week. So we thought it would be a great opportunity to pick his brain, to get some kind of practical insights um, into some of the kind of um, emerging mass damage claims that seem to be on the rise in Germany. Um, and so during this webinar, we're, we're going to spend the next 30 minutes kind of looking into why we're seeing a kind of surge in some of these uh, mass litigation claims, um, looking at kind of some of the business risks it presents and some practical insights into how people can kind of man manage the defense uh, of some of these claims. And we'll also kind of finish off by looking at Field Fisher X, which is the Field Fisher technology legal platform which we've developed to be able to help our clients manage some of these claims. Um, and before we kind of dig in, I, I thought it might be helpful just to provide a little bit of, of context as to why we thought this would be really interesting for our US audience. Um, I think there is a very well established kind of mass litigation uh, culture here in the US particularly around breaches of privacy and consumer law. Um, you know, there's a, a kind of teams of lawyers and third party litigation funders who stand to make enormous amounts of money from these uh, claims. But we haven't had quite the same culture historically in Europe, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, we don't have quite the same fee arrangements. Contingency fee arrangements are pretty rare uh, back in Europe. We've tended to have more of a focus on collective redress mechanisms and not these kind of mass litigation claims. And most of what we do tends to be on an opt-in, not an, an opt-out basis. Um, and generally the sort of amount of money that lawyers stand to make from some of these claims has been capped uh, by you know, the courts capping the amount of fees you can make and such like. So we just haven't had quite that history of, of that sort of mass litigation culture. But things are starting to change in Europe. Um, we've recently had a change in law in the form of the, a directive on representative actions, um, which has come into effect and effectively requires um, member states to make changes to their procedural rules to allow for collective um, redress mechanisms through kind of qualified um, entities like consumer groups. Um, and it's fair to say that directive hasn't been properly implemented in, in lots of member states. So we're still really in the kind of early stages of that. Um, but we have certainly started to see it weaponized in the Netherlands who have implemented that directive into their local law. And we've seen a recent kind of um, bunch of consumer groups in, in the Netherlands bringing a claim on behalf of close to 90,000 consumers, I think it is, against Google. So the tide is turning. Um, and like we've also seen a kind of interesting surge in claims in Germany, which is why we wanted to bring Stefan onto the webinar to kind of talk a little bit more about that. So Stefan, welcome and really interested to hear your perspective on is, is Germany heading to a world where it's going to have the same culture as the US or um, are we looking at quite a different landscape? Thank you, Blake. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me today. Yeah, um, in Germany, there is a very interesting development that started with the um, diesel scandal, diesel gate emission scandal. Um, and in the, during the diesel scandal, um, a lot of legal services provider emerged um, that provided technical infrastructure to handle um, mass claims, um, a high number of claims, um, and were offering their services to the law firms involved. And now that the diesel scandal is close to um, have ended. Um, all of these infrastructures that have been built are looking for new prey, um, and they found new prey actually. And we will look have a look at that in a minute. Um, what we currently also see is that they are testing the market with um, a lot of. They advertise um, mass claim cases and just have a look where they can get enough traction 
to acquire a sufficient number of cases to bring them to court and make money out of that. Field Fisher is currently representing clients in five mass claim complexes um, at different stages. So um, uh, one or two are still only out of court and two or three are um, already in court. So um, as Flick just said, um, German law does not know um, class actions like you know in the US, um, but the mass claim um, attacker law firms, they play around with the statutory lawyers fee scheme um, in Germany. And that scheme means that even for a low value claim, for instance, in the amount of 20 euro, there is a fixed statutory remuneration of 105 euro for the lawyer for an out of court representation and 165 euro mm. for an in court representation in the first instance. And that is earned by the lawyer regardless of whether a claim is won or lost. Um, the law firm will get paid in any event. And the only difference is who pays the bill, the defendant um, in case the attacker wins or the, cli uh, the client in case the attacker lo loses. And sometimes these law firms also cooperate with claim funders to make it easier for clients to um, subscribe to their services um, because there is no risk of a loss for these clients in that case. What does it mean? These cases can be scaled if there's a huge number of identical or near identical cases. A one-time invest of doing the legal work can be used for hundreds or thousands of cases, um, but the um, remuneration scheme means that they will earn the same amount of money for each of these cases. The areas there where we currently see a lot of movement um, and a lot of testing the market is consumer protection law, e-commerce regulation, um, also in the field of banking fees and life insurances, housing rent decreases, diesel gate still plays a smaller role, um, but also in privacy, in the field of privacy where data breaches and data leaks are really good targets for the um, attacker law firms because you have one breach of one set of facts that affects thousands or hundreds of thousands of users. Um, and we also see currently in the market the first attempts to construe a mass claim scenario based on breaches of cookie consent rules. For instance, if cookies are dropped on a website before any interaction with a consent management platform or consent banner happened. So Stefan, is it fair to say that they are looking for low-hanging fruit? So yeah. issues where it's a fairly, um, you know, it's a, a, a consumer-focused compliance requirement that just hasn't been met, and it's very clear from the window dressing, either on your your website or on your consumer kind of sales flow or something like that. Exactly. So um, whenever they see a case where there is a, a breach of something uh, of some regulation, whether that being privacy or um, consumer protection law, and where there is a setup where they can reach um, a sufficient number of um, affected um, potential clients, that would be the um, well, required scenario for an attack a law firm. It's not so relevant whether it is a kill shot or not, actually, because as I said before, um, they earn their money regardless of whether they win or lose. So for as long as there are um, smaller chances of winning that that probably be sufficient for an attacker law firm. Yeah, let's have a look um, on uh, a general strategic consideration because you may ask, okay, why not settle these claims if it's only a couple of euros per case? Um, you see here um, on this slide a scenario in blue where you settle. So an attacker law firm approaches you and says, I have 100 cases. I want 100 euros per case, um, and that's fine. But that will not make it go away. Uh, four weeks later, you will have the next letter from the attacker law firm with 1,000 cases. Another four weeks later, you will have the next letter with another 1,000 cases. And they will just continue to feed you with cases for as long as they are able to acquire new clients. And un unless you pay, um, well, you will um, uh, continue to see that. Um, so. The better strategy is also on economic terms to try and fight this and to make it commercially unviable for the attacker law firms to continue to feed your cases. Um, and then it will stop. If they don't earn money any longer, it will stop. 
And just a quick question, like historically with privacy litigation, it's been really hard to prove actual damage for some of the, the breaches. Um, and so how is that impacting this scenario? If you look at those claims that are brought on the basis to, uh, of, of privacy breaches, that will play a role, of course, because we, we have recent um, rulings from the European Court of Justice um, that essentially say, yes, there is immaterial damage, but it still must be damaged and it still must be proven. Um, mm -hmm. So it merely asserting before court that there was some kind of discomfort or anxiety will, will not su suffice. Yeah. yeah, but importantly, there is case law out there which confirms, and we've known this for a while, that the GDPR takes this very broad, rushed approach to damage. So non-material damage, distress, yeah. things like that are recoverable as damages. But of course, you just do have to prove a, an initial breach. To, and that's the... Yeah, you. yeah. And, and you have to look at the individual case, whether there has actually been an impact on the individual that, that is sufficient to award immaterial damages. Yeah. Yeah, but let's let's just have a look at two like case studies um, from yeah. what we do at the moment. So the first case is about consumer protection law. Um, we call it the order button issue. Um, the scenario is that an attacker law firm has acquired more than six thousand clients via online marketing um, and sent out demand letters um, to the defendant um, claiming repayment of fees um, for a subscription-based software service. Um, based on a couple of um, legal angles. Um, but the, the background here is that EU law requires that a button in the internet that uh, confirms a purchase must be labeled with very specific wording. And this wording is um, pay now or order now um, with obligation to pay. And if there is another wording the contract is deemed not concluded under German law. So there is a claim for repayment of fees um, based on unjust enrichment. So let's have a look at the German uh, statute, that, statute that says that. Um, it's uh, translated here, but it says basically, yes, there you have to label the button with um, obligation to pay. Um, and um, the next paragraph says that the contract is only formed if the trader complies with this duty. Um, so, did we skip a slide? Sorry. Because uh, of my. There you go. Uh, yeah. um, also, the ECJ um, ruled in another case that it is completely irrelevant whether the um, well, commercial character of that transaction becomes apparent. Of, the circumstances, for instance, if just next to the ordering button, there is language that says you'll have to pay 50 euros if you push the button. It must be the button. It's very formalistic um, and the courts will not look at the well, context of, um, of these cases. So if we look at that in court, um, we now see um, a scale and automated filing of these claims before various district courts. Unlike um, the US, um, it's not um, consolidated before one court, like in a class action. Um, it's just spread across the country, um, all the district courts. Um, we see at the moment slightly above 100 cases that have been served and counting. Um, and the claimant um, uses another specialist legal services provider that provides these automated mass litigation services. Um, commercial background here, um, we have an average value of a claim of 150 euro, um, the statutory out of court um, remuneration of 105 and the statutory court remuneration, remuneration of 285. Um, across 6,000 cases that makes um, for a total exposure of 3.5 million um, on top come the own legal costs of the defendant. Um, from a strategy perspective, um, in this case, the substantive law arguments aren't particularly strong. Um, there are some, but um, well, it's not that you can be very bold in that regard. So strategy is also to increase the cost per case for the attacker law firm. We made our calculations. We found that they have a profit margin of around 80 or 70 euros. Um, so we figured that if we can increase the cost per case by 71 euro, it'll stop. What we do is we create automated templates for the various procedural documents, statements of defense, and so on. Um, and in order to, um, well, 
in order to increase the effort for them, we well, also try to find ways that force them to reach out to their clients on an individual basis. For instance, um, we challenge the POA um, and then they have to go back to the clients and may have to get a wet signature POA and stuff like that. Um, on our side as well, we have a dedicated technology platform that allows us to scale and handle um, these cases in an automated manner. Um, it's called Field Fisher X. Um, operating out of Berlin in Germany. This is just an example of how, just, uh, of how an automated um, document could look like. These yellow, um, marked yellow um, elements are um, the stuff that will just be replaced by the proper um, input data from our databases. Um, from a strategy, um, angle um, of course there was a quick fix so just to close um, close down uh, the opportunity for the attacker to acquire new cases um, there is a um, also a challenge on our side um, that concerns the cooperation model with the litigation funder um, we saw that there are a couple of well at least unclear provisions in the terms and conditions that they put forward to their clients. Um, we suggest to the client that they should work on increasing the costs per acquisition, um, for instance, by bidding on adverts that the attacker law firms use. And um, of course, we also want to increase, increase the legal effort um, with procedural defenses and by creating variants of our defense pleadings that forces them also to, to work on variants um, and require different responses. We exploit data quality issues because we, we saw that they are not um, perfect um, in that regard. Um, we explore a couple of counterclaims that in certain circumstances um, may play a role. And we also um, consider counterattacks on the advertising um, and marketing measures of these attacker law firms because they, well, sometimes they Go a bit of go a bit beyond of what is allowed. That was the consumer protection case. The the second case is a data leak um, based case. Um, we see uh, several attacker law firms jumping on that issue, also against several clients actually because um, there was there is a case or several leaks um, and several clients um, are attacked at the moment. And um, here there is a standard mode of operation. They always send damages uh, or warning letters and, and demand letters out where they ask for damages of a minimum of 3,000 euros um, because of an alleged breach of security measures and an alleged breach of notification requirements under the GDPR. Um, they ask for a confirmation that um, the clients will also pay future damages. They put forward a data subject access request, a DSAR under Article 15 GDPR. They put forward a claim for further information um, about the breach, including the identity of hackers. This is ridiculous, actually. And a cease and desist claim, um, stop making available data without adequate security measures. And, and we see that pattern in a lot of cases right now. So it's 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 not particular to one specific breach. Um, the, the source for the information for the attacker law firms is, is often websites like I, Have I Been Pawned or similar um, websites um, and they simply look, for, look out for new breaches and whenever a new breach um, is published then they would start marketing and try to farm claimants. And is it fair to say that these would mostly be data leaks affecting big consumer facing? Yes, that's that's fair to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. You, of course, you have like the the big um, platforms like Meta um, and, and Twitter, and uh, so yeah. And how are they quantifying three thousand euros each and every time? Uh, it, it's a bit of a wild guess, I believe. Um, so they they saw that in particular cases. Um, in Germany, there have been rulings where the courts awarded 2,500 or 5,000, mm -hmm. but that were a bit of, of a different story, I believe. So we had one breach concerning a, a credit card vendor 
um, or credit card provider. So um, the data that was affected by that breach was much more sensitive than the data you would probably see in, in a meta case or something like yeah. that. So um, yeah, from from a strategy point, um, it's important that you um, respond to the data subject access request um, in accordance with the EDPB guidance and of course in accordance or within 30 days as uh, you're obliged to under the GDPR. Um, if you don't, then that would open up another angle of attack because then they can on top claim for damages because of an insufficient DESA response. So that's very important to get that right. And then the rest is simply automating again the, the responses. Um, and um, we now see or saw a couple of claims that have been served in court. So the, um, of course, they tried to play that DSAR um, response argument and ask for another 2,000 euros <laughs> based on allegedly insufficient response to the DSARs. That is based on the argument that the DSAR response should include information about the breach. Um, which, well, we believe is not the case um, in any event, the, well, they have already had that information. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is in court now, um, and we have a case here where we have a good factual situation, um, no intrusion into client systems, uh, data was publicized by users voluntarily and willingly, so there's also a strong argument that they, uh, everybody knew the risk. Um, and um, because of the automation, and that's also a very important point, there is no individualized statement um, concerning the actual damage suffered or loss. Um, we have very, very um, well standardized and, and not very specific language about anxiety, about discomfort, about uh, an alleged uptick in spam and, and um, cold calling and stuff like that without any evidence offered. Um, and the first courts um, already in, in other cases dismissed that, uh, dismissed the claims exactly on that basis because um, there was no um, well, individualized statement um, of losses and damages. Is there also an angle? I mean, not every data breach is caused by a breach of the GDPR, right? There's just some, you know, yeah, exactly. sometimes they're inevitable and yes. you could have done the best you That's could also implement argument. Yeah. security yeah. measures. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So the, the GDPR doesn't say there must never be a breach. The yeah. GDPR says you have to have adequate security measures in place and acknowledges that even the best security measures might not provide 100% security. Right. So exactly, yeah, that, that's also the case here. Um, and um, yeah, so one of uh, one, one important strategy element here is, and that's a clever, clever play of the attacker law firm. So because they already claim for determination that the defendants have to be a future damages, which may look as a side issue and just like a formality in, in the first place, but this is really dangerous because if you win on the basis that damages have not been established, then this claim will still stand mm -hmm. because they could be able in the future to establish damages. And if they win on that, um, they could like adopt their approach in the future and only claim for the determination, mm -hmm. still earn the statutory legal fees, win on that, um, and that would still be a bad situation even if there was no, at least no imminent um, financial obligation concern for the defendant side. To so pay. they have a couple of routes here. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. And so we realistically looking at most cases you end up having to settle here. Well, uh, as I said at the beginning, settling might not be a good idea because that sets you up for being fed continuously right. with new cases. Um, and so also here, I think winning this case in particular, these cases, I believe the chances are good to win on the merits. Mm -hmm. Um, because security measures have been adequate, because there was never a breach in the first place, because mm -hmm. um, users have contributed willingly and, and voluntarily to the publicity of data. So, yeah, it's... It's worth the fight to avoid it's the worth, avalanche. I think it's worth the fight, yes. Yeah. Um, and then settling remains an option mm -hmm. and is still an option if you find that at a certain point in time that your situation isn't not as good as you believe it is. 
And how do you think the new kind of directive on representative actions could impact here? Because we know it's going to, you know, we know in other states they're a little bit behind in implementing yeah. this. But say, uh, you know, um, they've been successful in winning awards in Germany. Does that then make it more appealing to go and try and use these new collective redress mechanisms in other member states? Yeah, actually, I, I don't think that it will it will have an impact on these scenarios right. because. The, the commercial model behind this here is that they exploit the um, statutory fee scheme. So it's very specific um, to the German. That this is specific to the German market. Yeah. It may work in a similar fashion in other markets. I don't know mm -hmm. that, but um, I don't think the the new EU based uh, mass determination claim is attractive from a commercial perspective mm -hmm. for these. Law, attacker law firms, so okay. they, because they won't just earn enough money out of it. It may be a different issue if you really like, if you use that as a tool to collect thousands of cases mm -hmm. and then are able to like work on a contingency basis. But that again is very difficult under yeah. German professional rules. Right. Yeah. yeah. But there is a bit of discussion about that as well, um, also about other professional rules in Germany, and that we may see a well, slightly more leeway um, in the future, um, and um, so yeah, it'll all, all depend on whether the attacker law firms can make a business case out of that. Yeah, there's money yeah. to be made, and and like we said, in the, I think we hinted at in the beginning, there's not the same ability to advertise your services. I mean, in the US, we see what I call the ambulance yeah. chasers all the way down the freeway with their billboards. You can't do that in Europe. To be right, really safe right. Looking at. And they, what we see at the moment is that the main marketing channel is the internet, and even there they go often beyond of what they are supposed to do on the yeah. professional services rules. The other thing that really amps up the class action culture here is third party litigation funding. Um, yeah. is there, how does that work in, in Germany? Yeah, that, that's something that we see often at the moment. Um, so um, the, there are a couple of litigation funders also in this market. So um, traditionally, it's, it's not a new phenomenon in Germany, mm. um, but traditionally it was more about individual cases right. where the uh, potential reward for that individual case was very, very big, um, so mm -hmm. multi-million dollar or billion dollar cases. Um, but um, now we see that in this market as well, um, and it works very similar, I believe, to the US, so the, the litigation fund that would receive a certain percentage of the amount that they um, are able to get out of um, yeah. the cases and um, for in exchange um, he would uh, well, fund the, the litigation and pay the lawyers um, yeah so th that of course makes it easier to market the cases because there's no risk for the individual mm -hmm. consumers of time. Um, <laughs> sorry and um, it's um, therefore a marketing tool. If they do not do it with litigation funders, then of course each client has a risk um, mm -hmm. of losing and then also being obliged to pay the lawyers. Right, and that's important because that is a, almost, that's very dissuasive for people to have to take on that. Yeah, and might even be surprising for the people um, in the end yeah. because they, well, I wonder if, if uh, everybody is aware of that risk. So if I'm a, a smaller consumer facing business, I'm just starting to do business in Germany, I might not have got all of my, you know, consumer flow perfectly set yeah. up. Yeah. Um, what's the reality of my risk here? Are they going to more likely go against a bigger consumer platform with yeah. more users or do I still need to be worrying? Yeah, I think it, it is time to worry actually. And of course there are, uh, regulatory requirements where a breach does not trigger damages claims and if you are not 100% clear on that all fine but there are some and you should be well very diligent about these where uh, a breach could potentially result in um, a, a repayment claim or yeah. something like that or damages um, and and these uh, I think there are a couple of, of these requirements also the right to with the right to withdraw from a contract mm -hmm. um, if you do it right, it's only a two weeks right. right. If you don't do it right, it's a one one year or two weeks right. right. That can really hurt you. And Stefan's referring to we have these um, you know very specific consumer law requirements that impact 
a payments flow or any attempt to you know offer digital services to consumers and you know failure to do that um properly is what can give rise to some of these claims yeah. is what we're referring to yeah and i think it changes the the approach to a european expansion um actually because um 10 years ago like ignoring or be a bit lenient about compliance in europe was yeah. a very good business strategy grow your business first and then take care of mm -hmm. everything else um, this is not the case anymore. Um, it's not only the GDPR and, and the regulation with fines, it's things like the mass claims here. Mm -hmm. They sit and waiting for new opportunities and once they see something, they will go after it. Of course, if you're small, you're not a likely, um, uh, likely uh, victim um, because um, it, for them, one relevant factor is the cost per acquisition. And if you have like 10 million customers in Germany, mm -hmm. then um, the marketing effort per customer um, they or per new client will not be as high if it's only 100,000 right. clients in Germany where they have to go the extra mile to, to get you. Um, yeah, it, fr from a business perspective, uh, also important to understand that this will look small in the beginning. So you might receive a letter from a law firm mm -hmm. that you don't know, that it's not a big law firm. Um, and the, the lawyer writes something like, hey, I have 10 customers or 50 customers. Um, you have been in breach of X, Y, Z. We want our money back. Oh, let's, let's discuss. Let's negotiate. Um, if you negotiate, you're on the hook. Um, and if you don't, um, this might well expand into something where it's not only 50, but 5,000. So I guess that gives us a good opportunity then to sort of wrap up and, and provide some key takeaways for yeah. people. So we know that ignoring some of these consumer and privacy law requirements, certainly in Germany, can come with this risk of these claims coming. But in terms of defence strategy then, what are the sort of key takeaways? From, from our point of view, so one very important thing is that um, if you if you sense it could be a mass claim scenario, you should reach out to to us or well, some, some other law firm with the capacity to automate. The Ideally, field fisher. Ideally, field fisher. <laughs> but it's important to have the uh, capacity um, for a defense automation because the strategy behind these mass claims is also to overwhelm the defendants mm -hmm. because it's a volume game. Yeah, and literally you can have cases where you at a certain day uh, in the morning there comes a truck with three tons of paper. And then it's not really about having legal arguments. It's about How quickly can where you where them? can I store three tons of paper, right. and and who will read that? Right. And um, so if you sense that it's a mass claim, it's good to to have someone help you set up an infrastructure that can handle this. And um, yeah, then from a strategy perspective, um, in most cases, I believe it's it's good to fight. Um, things can still be settled, but if you settle in the beginning, then it will just be a pipeline that goes on for ever and ever. Mm -hmm. Cool, I think you've given us some really interesting insights in, into the world of mass litigation in Germany and certainly some food for thought if you're a consumer facing organization starting to do business or already doing significant business in Germany, kind of paying attention to some of those basic compliance requirements that are low hanging fruit for some of these claim farmers. So make sure those cookie banners are right, make sure your consumer flow and data capture flow is, is in compliance with the local consumer law requirements. Um, and um, if you have a data breach, then make sure that you are very clearly taking all of the mitigation steps quickly to try and contain the issue and, um, and deal with it in compliance with your obligations under the GDPR. Um, so thank you very much, Stefan, for, for joining us on this webinar. Thank you. Um, great to have you. And um, look out for more Phil Fisher webinars that will be posting some new topics coming up in the next few weeks. And this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, so look forward to seeing you on another webinar soon. Thanks, everyone.